Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. everyone and welcome to today's virtual program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Heather Knight, a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle and your moderator for the program. The Commonwealth Club has of course shifted from in-person programs to virtual events and is grateful for the support of its viewers. It appreciates all donations and if you'd like to contribute, click on the blue donate button at the top of the YouTube chat box or visit the club's website at commonwealthclub.org. You can submit questions for the guests via the chat room next to your screen, and I'll get to as many as possible later in the hour. And now on to today's program. Over the last few decades, San Francisco has experienced radical changes with the influence of Silicon Valley and tech companies, as well as spiking home prices, a growing inequality gap, a swelling homelessness crisis, the squeezing out of artists, musicians, and other creative types, and a whole lot more. Countless articles and even movies have tried to capture the complex nature of what San Francisco has become, a place many people love to call home, but are still considering leaving. In the new book, The End of the Golden Gate, 25 acclaimed writers take on the eternal question, should I stay or should I go? A percentage of the proceeds from The End of the Golden Gate will go to Hamilton Families, which serves homeless parents and children. I wanted to also let you know that the Chronicle has started a new Total SF book club in partnership with the San Francisco Public Library and Green Apple Books. And we're picking a new book every quarter that's written by a local author and or is about the city itself. Coincidentally, our summer read is the end of the Golden Gate and we'll be having an event hosted by the library on August 24th. You can register at the library's events page now. Today we'll hear from three particularly compelling contributors to the book. Journalist and historian Gary Camilla, essayist, poet, and cultural critic Kimberly Reyes, and writer and musician Daniel Handler, also known as Lemony Snicket. Let me say a bit, bit more about each of them. Gary Camilla writes the history column Portals of the Past for the San Francisco Chronicle, so he is a colleague of mine. He's the author of the bestseller, Cool Gray City of Love, and its follow-up, Spirits of San Francisco. They're both excellent reads, and I highly recommend reading them. Gary was born in Oakland, grew up in Berkeley, and has lived in San Francisco since 1971. He holds a bachelor's and master's in English literature from UC Berkeley, and he co-founded the website Salon.com and was the executive editor of the San Francisco Magazine. Kimberly Reyes is a, an award-winning poet, essayist, and literary and cultural critic who began her career as a music and entertainment reporter. She transitioned to creative writing after receiving her Master's of Arts from Columbia University's Journalism School. Her writing has been featured, sorry, there's a lot to say about all three of them, <laughs> in The Atlantic, The New York Times, and Time, among many others. Kimberly was also Kimberly was also selected as a 2019 Fulbright Scholar studying Irish literature and film at the University College Cork, and she currently sits on the Fulbright Commission's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Board. And Daniel Handler is the author of seven novels, and as Lemony Snicket, he's written numerous children's books, too. Daniel's books have sold more than 70 million copies and have been translated into 40 languages. They've been adapted for film, stage, and television, including the recent adaptation of a series of unfortunate events for which he was awarded both the Peabody and Writers Guild of America Awards. We should also finally note that Daniel has played the accordion in several bands, and we will not object to a performance tonight if he is so moved. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there welcome. is no accordion and spitting distance, just so you know. Uh, that's the Commonwealth Club is about to deliver an accordion to me, which would delight me. <laughs> well, I wanted to welcome the three of you. Uh, first question wanted to know what drew you to participate in this project and whether your involvement began pre-pandemic or during the pandemic. The book really feels very of the moment, but it doesn't touch um, on COVID really. So Gary, since you wrote the introduction as well as an essay, can you kind of describe how this came to be? Uh, yeah, um, 
Ava Avery of Chronicle Books uh, reached out to me and asked me about it. And I was also in communication with Mark, Mark Tauber, who's the uh, editor of Chronicle Books. And so they asked me if I would want to write an essay on this uh, on this subject. And I said I would. And then they asked me if I wanted to write the introduction. And I said, sure. So uh, <laughs> that's that's basically it was a pretty f- straightforward gig. They asked me and I said, yes. <laughs> when and did it, it all begin? And I guess I'm I think it was right. I think they reached out to me right around the time the pandemic was beginning. If I remember Hmm. correctly, I I feel like it was, you know, like January, February, March or something like that of last year. So it can remember. Yeah, but it was it was right at the at the edge of everything shutting down was was Mm -hmm. when they when they, they asked. And Kimberly, why did you want to be involved in this project? Um, Actually, the essay that I contributed was in the bold italic uh, in 2018, um, and it got just so many. The response was overwhelming. I mean, I had written for, um, you know, uh, way bigger audiences for other outlets, and I I easily got like thousands of responses to this. And so um, when Chronicle reached out to participate and include the essay, I just thought it seemed it seemed like the right thing to do. Cool. And Daniel, why did you want to participate in this book? Um, I think because San Francisco is really important to me. Um, uh, like Kimberly, the essay had been uh, previously elsewhere, and um, I made a few changes kind of here and there. But um, I, I am born and raised in San Francisco, and um, the, I've seen the city through a lot of changes. And um, though I think people both, I think people are both alarmist about the changes and under alarmist about the changes in many ways. And so I was just interested in participating in that conversation. And I mean, honestly, um, they showed me the list of writers who were already participating. And I was pleased to see that it was such a kind of lively and diverse group of perspectives and things like that. It's just a great, it's a really fun anthology to read, I think. Yeah, an all-star cast. Um, I wanted to ask each of you also as San Francisco emerges from the pandemic and life is starting to feel a little bit more normal again, how you all are feeling about the city now. Are you optimistic, pessimistic? Um, What's your San Francisco vibe these days? Um, Kimberly, we'll start with you. Um, I'm actually in New York City right now. Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I uh, had been in Ireland um, previously, so I hadn't haven't been back to San Francisco in about a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm set to come back in September, um, and so I guess I can say. I'm a bit nervous to see um, what it looks like post pandemic, but I'm also a bit excited because I know a lot of what I found annoying about the city has left. (laughs) So (laughs) I I really can't wait to see what that looks like. When did you leave and what did you find annoying about the city? Um, I left to do the Fulbright scholarship and that was in 2019. I just felt uh, I was a bit annoyed about the people who colonized from the tech industry and, you know, didn't who kind of sucked things out, but didn't put anything back Mm -hmm. um, into the city. Um, And I would like to think that maybe um, that's changed a bit. Mm -hmm. And Daniel, how about you? How are you feeling as the city emerges from this past dreadful year? Um, I think I change my mind every five minutes. (laughs) Um, I was really pleased, uh, for instance, um, at the end of Kimberly's essay that she writes about going to Ocean Beach um, as a solace for her because Ocean Beach has always been a solace for me. And during the pandemic, it's really been a solace. And like the that's kind of how I've kept the temperature of it for a while. There was that weird um, panic in the early part of the pandemic where you know, they were like, the beach is the most dangerous. We got to shut this down. (laughs) The only way to shut that down is to put like an orange cone right by the sand because no one would care about (laughs) that. And so there was kind of that moment. And then when people were reaching at least a slightly more calm place and a place of better understanding, there were more people there. So there was many people I met, uh, you know, I arranged to meet there and walk with and things like that. And so, um, and uh, I was there today and um, it looked pretty and hopeful. So it made yeah. me pretty and hopeful, but sometimes it felt like the end of the world and sometimes yeah. it felt okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't know, I had a dinner party. That's a sign Ooh. of progress, I think. That's awesome. Yeah. People were in my house eating. That felt good. <laughs> good. 
And Gary, how are you feeling as the city emerges? We're likely to some, somewhat go back to normal June 15th. And are you feeling optimistic, optimistic or pessimistic? Well, we did incredibly well on the public health side. Um, you know, we're one of the best cities in the country in terms of COVID rates, of deaths, of infections. So we can give ourselves a pat on the back for how the city handled that. Um, then that's the big one, of course. But almost an equally big one is the economic impact of COVID. And um, that's been pretty devastating for a lot of small businesses. There's a lot of, of legacy businesses and beloved places that have gone out of business or may still go out of business. And we haven't seen all those shoes drop yet. So uh, that's that's a huge one as well. And I hope that, you know, we can save as many of those, especially the small businesses as possible. There's some other good things that have come out of it and that I think there's going to be some political fights about some of them. Mm -hmm. But everything from the parklets to the slow streets, um, I think that the sort of New Orleansization of San Francisco, the go cups, the drinking on the street, <laughs> the, the, the Parisian cafe atmosphere is a fantastic thing. I really hope that they keep all of that. And I hope that they beat back the and I understand that some of the small business owners are worried because they don't have parking and they think it's going to hurt their business. And this also people don't say, oh, they've, they've the closing street. They're going to close the great highway, closing JFK. That's causing all of this furor. But I really hope that, um, you know, we're able to actually continue with those uh, urban experiments. If you have to tweak them, you have to tweak them. But I don't I hope that the car culture doesn't win this uh, debate again. And I think we have an opportunity to actually move in a really good direction that way right now. Yeah, that actually segues perfectly into my next question, which was, um, was there a silver lining from the pandemic um, in the city that you really loved and that you hope stays forever. And my example for myself was going to be the car free JFK drive and great highway that I hope are left that way, but there's already fights about it at city hall um, as there always are. So did you have a favorite um, silver lining, Daniel? I mean, I'm at pain to call it a silver lining, frankly, because I think that to paint the pandemic as anything but disastrous. Yeah. Leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Um, and, and I guess I can only measure that because it's hard to think of someone who was in a better position than me and my family. Mm -hmm. We were in San Francisco. We're in very comfortable circumstances. You know, we had some outdoor space. We have a very nice house because of the cavalcade of luck that has happened to me. And we were pretty miserable. And I feel like if I was miserable, then anyone who had a bigger challenge than me, which would be literally anyone, has got to be miserable too. And, um, but I mean, I will say I was grateful for a, a number of things. And um, it seems like a good time to say that one of the things I was grateful for was Heather Knight's uh, contributions to uh, the school. I, I did not pay you to say that. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, I have a kid in public school. And um, the real tumultuousness of the San Francisco Unified School District, and um, you know, which I'm, I bet is a whole book in and of itself, but not to be written by me. Um, and I was really grateful for. Uh, I think I know the Chronicle really had to kind of uh, hunker down, and a lot of reporters I know took on different beats and really took it there, and to feel like that was reliable information, and that was. Um, something to chew over and, and a, you know, in this, in the world that we're in now felt good. And I think the natural beauty of San Francisco, um, mm -hmm. you know, is such a comfort. And I think that it is one of the things that feels like it's still kind of within reach of equity is that there's so much um, public land that, you know, that it's, that so many people can be close to, you know, that mm -hmm. so many people can go and look and stare at the water or kind of at least sit distancedly under a tree <laughs> and experience that, like that felt like a comfort too. But mm -hmm. I just, um, as we come, as, as San Francisco comes out of it and we're so ahead of the curve in so many places and all over the world, I'm just super wary of silver lining. It makes me feel it's, you know, it's yeah. not, a silver lining is like, oh, it turns out it's all worthwhile because this thing happened. And like, I don't see that in where we are. No, fair enough. And Kimberly, how about you in New York City? Did you can you describe what the past year has been like there? And if there was anything good you think came out of it? 
Um, sure. Yeah, I was actually in Ireland for pretty much most of the pandemic, um, watching in horror um, to see what was what happened to New York initially. Um, but I was initially really proud of San Francisco. I was so proud of the numbers um, and even just seeing how my friends treated the pandemic on Instagram and stuff like um, it just felt like a sense of urgency and taking it seriously um, in New York, in both New York and San Francisco um, that you didn't necessarily see in other parts of the country. Um, and even just coming back from Ireland, they're still in level five. I mean, they they can't, there, there are no restaurants open. They can't mm. even go to the s- store to get the clothing. They've been wearing the same clothing for a year and a half um, and to come back to the states um, in places like New York and San Francisco and to see the progress that's been made it, it makes me really proud mm-hmm. and the pandemic shined a really bright light on the city's faults and what it's getting right you know everything was just magnified for better or for worse and I wondered if each of you maybe learned something from the past year about your city that you didn't know Gary anything that well, occurred to you um yeah, I mean, we it, it confirmed, I guess, that, you know, how how this is an area and a city that believes in science uh, that doesn't regard any infringement on its individual liberties as a, you know, something that's going to bring down the, 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 the house of liberty that, you know, you can you can uh, give up certain things for the greater good. So that was all a confirmation, I think, of what we knew. Some of the things that happened. The, the difficult things that happened, I don't know if it was a surprise, but it was certainly there were a lot of train wrecks and they were probably inevitable. The ones that involve the really intractable problems the city faces, like the homeless crisis, which has now been going on for decades and really, you know, became a huge, incredible problem, especially in the Tenderloin. There was a lawsuit that was brought by Hastings and others because of the tents on the street. The city was basically caught in a no win situation there. They remove the tents, they pop up somewhere else. Um, but, you know, that just it just showed that just shined a bright light on a problem that probably, frankly, and, and I've reported on this quite a bit, it is, is beyond San Francisco, th- its ability to solve by itself. I mean, mm-hmm. I think we need a sort of a federal marshal plan and this is going to take decades. Um, but, you know, it's it's a huge problem. And, and, the, and the covid crisis really exacerbated it and made made the I've never seen Jones Street and the lower tenderloin as bad in my whole 50 years here. Mm-hmm. It was the worst I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And of course, we had far more drug overdose deaths than covid deaths by a yeah, factor of even, about three. Right. Way more. So the whole fentanyl yeah. crisis is just out of control, too. Right. Mm-hmm. Kimberly, you've been living a bunch of different places, but did the pandemic shine a bright light on any one of them for you? Like, you know, learned something or took a took something away from it? Uh, yeah, actually, as an introvert um, and a writer, um, I really appreciate I learned a lot about um, safeguarding my energy for the future um, and just setting uh, aside time to write and not feeling bad about saying no to things. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like I wrote at least you know, twofold more than I did in past years, simply because I wasn't having my energy sucked away by other people. Um, And so, um, you know, in all the horrors of this, that was the one good thing. And I think a lot of us introverts are going to come out of this kind of like swinging, you know what I mean? Just (laughs) being, feeling the power to say no, because um, we we feel how good it is to just sit with our own energy um, uninterrupted. Do you think you'll be able to keep that up or will it be harder once there are more social obligations? Um, I have always been a charming misanthrope, I'd say. Um, And now I, and, you know, people who know me know that about me. And I feel like now it's just level 20, you know, (laughs) Um, I absolutely feel unapologetic about saying, no, I don't have anything better to do, but I still choose to not (laughs) be where you'd like me to be because I want to read or write. That's a good, good takeaway. How about you, Daniel? I'm just, I think the image that I'm going to take home from, or I am home, but the image that I'm going to keep with me from today is the idea of like an introvert coming out swimming, swinging. <laughs> <laughs> Look out, everybody, the introvert <laughs> coming out swinging. Um, I think, so uh, under normal circumstances, I spend most of my day writing in public places. I write in libraries, I write in cafes, and um I like being out there. And um, another of uh, another writer that I interviewed for an event, not like this one, put it in a way that really crystallized it for me. He said that he missed strangers more than his friends. 
Wow. And, um, and that really struck me because I think I met, I, my sister and my mother both live in town. And so we all potted a little bit as after the first kind of initial panic. And, um, you know, I had regular Zoom drinks dates and then yard dates and beach dates and things like that with the people who were important to me. But um, no, I didn't get the chatter of people just next to me. You know, I didn't get the kind of supermarket opinions that happen. I mean, I continue to go to Rainbow Grocery, but there were no arguments in line. So I just feel like it didn't <laughs> have a Rainbow Grocery experience. And just, um, and I mean, that's, I think, why I live in a city and why I live in a city like San Francisco, where you can be challenged by your own assumptions and conclusions all the time. You, know, you just bump up against somebody and you think, oh, right. They're living this way. This is what's going this way. Their philosophy comes from here. And I mean, even just seeing someone like Gary, I haven't seen Gary for a long time. And like under normal circumstances, we would run into each other and some circumstance, both being kind of bookish nerds with nothing better to do on a rent, <laughs> we would run into each other in something. And um, I think that, that I, it really taught me, and maybe this is the opposite of being an introvert, but it really taught me that I missed the companionship of people I did not know and people I did not understand. And there was something about bunkering down with and seeing people that I already loved and who for the most part, my perspectives are more or less in line. I think that was not good for me. It was not a good reminder. And I, and it, I think that really for me struck home on um, January 6th where, yeah. I mean, San Francisco was always a, a leftist bubble in that way. And to really think, oh, there is something about a wide swath of the population that I'm not understanding. I'm really not getting it. I can think about white supremacy. I can think about kind of Trump loyalty. I can think about media misinformation, but there's something here that I'm not understanding. And I think having before that spent so much time only with kind of people who held that perspective, I think that was really eye-opening for me, a reminder of that. Yeah, that's a good point. And I wanted to ask each of you a question specific to your own essay. Start with you, Gary. Um, the tech industry and its impact on San Francisco is a major theme in your um, essay. And you have some really funny passages about getting used to the tech invasion and likening yourself to um, Mr. Wilson railing at Dennis the Menace, um, which is the tech industry, <laughs> and how you didn't want to do that, especially because that means that well, I'm going to get your metaphor wrong, so I won't even try it. But um, I was wondering now that a lot of tech, tech workers have left and some companies are scaling down or leaving altogether, if you think that San Francisco will miss the tech industry and all of the taxes that came with it, or do you think it's more of a good riddance kind of thing? Oh, I would I think it's I would never want to say good riddance to an industry that drove the economic revival of a city that had 10 percent unemployment. Um, there's obviously all kinds of downsides to the tech invasion and cultural ones and you know gentrification. The, the, the litany goes on and on. But it's it's extremely complicated. I try to treat you know, everybody that I come upon in the city uh, with, a, you know, with with give them a break. You know, I don't I don't assume that because of anybody's demographics, their job, their age, uh, what they're like. Now, they may uh, give me a strong indication when they begin braying like, you know, the drunken frat boys <laughs> Some of them are on the roof next to me. But I try not to get too bummed about that either, because, you know, I was young and drunken and braying myself at one time. They just have a lot more money. So I think that, you know, the fact that a lot of them are leaving, um, first of all, just empirically, I don't think we know yet how many are really going to leave. There's like, there was quite an exodus in the last year, for sure. But I think it's still a little up in the air. There's obviously been some big tech companies that actually have left. Others are threatening to leave. But this still is a very desirable area. It's got the universities, Silicon Valley. It's just got this legacy with engineering and science. So I'm, I don't really see a massive shift that way. I think we've seen a little correction and we saw the rents go down, but the rents are going back up now. Yeah. Um, and whether or not that's you know tech workers coming back or that's just the rest of the world, which has also rushed into San Francisco in the last you know decades, it's not clear yet. But um, no, I think that we're going to, you know, people that are hoping that it's going, we're going to suddenly wake up and the Mabuhay Gardens are going to be back and there's going to be 
like punks living in cheap <laughs> apartments in the mission. And, you know, everything's going to be hearts and, and countercultural flowers uh, dream on because I don't think that's going to happen. I think this city is going to be a Carmel like Santa Fe like boutique big city economically. I'm not I'm not saying that's really what it's going to be in its essence, but it's, it's going to be a very expensive city in general, I, I think, forever. And uh, yes, if we build a lot more housing, that may push that down a little bit. But I don't there's so much demand that to some degree, San Francisco is a little bit impervious to the, you know, the law of building and driving prices down. I don't think it's completely impervious. We actually saw that when the tech people left because we saw the rents go down, but they've come up again now. So Mm -hmm. um, I I don't think there's going to be as big a change as a lot of people think, actually. I was really surprised that the housing prices didn't come down at all during the pandemic. And they're actually higher than ever with the average price now, $1.8 million just for your basic. I mean, that's crazy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's nuts. The rent never comes down enough. I mean, I just feel like somebody who spent their youth in San Francisco and there was always kind of talk of like, Oh, don't worry. In a few years it's coming down. And it's like, doesn't, it doesn't come down in such a way that's really going to make sense when you're, um, doing the economics of living a life. It's not no. suddenly affordable. No. Um, Kimberly, I found your essay called On Being Black in San Francisco really compelling. San Franciscans like to think of our city as diverse and progressive, but you haven't always found that. And you wrote, um, I really like this quote, although I live less than two miles from both the Trader Joe's and a Whole Foods, I drive to the Sprouts in Daly City so I can roam the aisles in sweats and not be followed or glared at most of the time. And I wondered if you can talk more about that and how the reality of being black in San Francisco doesn't match the reputation that we have for progressiveness and acceptance. Yeah, so I didn't move to San Francisco thinking that it was going to be uh, super diverse, especially when it came to black people. Um, I kind of knew better than that, but I still thought um, there'd be some level of, uh, I guess, acceptance (laughs) in the difference of people um, that I didn't necessarily find. And it's hard to say if that's a I don't know if that's something in like just in the city itself or the people who are attracted to the city. Um, and I don't think any place gets it right. There's no utopia. You know, I mean, obviously I've, tr- I travel the world all the time looking for it. I haven't found it yet. Um, and it's interesting because, um, you know, obviously New York is similar to San Francisco in a lot of ways when it comes to housing prices and gentrification, but the same thing's happening to Dublin, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, like a lot, it, Dublin's the home of, uh, the tech industry in Europe. Um, so all of these companies have headquarters, you know, the Facebooks, the Googles in Dublin. And so it's like, it's just cruel that no matter where I go, I can't escape it. So I don't, I don't think it's just a San Francisco problem. I just think it's just globalization. You know, Mm -hmm. um, there's there's really no running from it. But I think the cruelness in seeing it happen in San Francisco is because it does sort of um, it doesn't even advertise itself as. But it just I think we hope that it is this better place in America. Um, And it's really not that different than the rest of America. If anything, Mm -hmm. the rest of America is more honest about who they are and what they stand for. I think things are just deceptive and covert in San Francisco when it comes to intolerance. Hmm, that's interesting. And Daniel, your essay is called On Marriage, Writing and a Changing City. I had one little stylistic question. Why did you refer to your wife each time as Lisa Brown and not just Lisa? Um, that's just her name. I don't know. Her name is Lisa Brown. Everybody calls her. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because I confuse her with some other Lisa. I married. <laughs> I've only got the one. But okay. yeah, everybody calls her Lisa Brown. Oh. <laughs> Um, Your essay compares living in a city to a marriage and how each one evolves over time and and that change is a given. And you said you're excited about the future of San Francisco, which was refreshing considering so many people are so down on it. And what makes you the most excited? What makes me the most excited? I think always young people make me the most excited. I think um, people for looking for what's next and who don't feel burdened by... um, by having sitting in their own history, kind of. I don't mean to imply that they don't know it or something like that, but they're not, they feel less, um, I think, burdened by that. And I think that's always hopeful to me. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, watching the young students who are with my son at School of the Arts, they're with the School of the Arts in San Francisco, fills me with hope. And um, 
I think, yeah, I think every time I see a piece of art made by a young person that I don't really understand, or, you know, there's something blaring out of somebody's speakers that I don't get, or there's like, I drive by a place that's clearly suddenly become a hot on me place or the place where people are sitting around smoking or whatever it is. There's something that's totally inaccessible to me that they somehow have neglected to tell a 50 year one year old white man who's living in a house. Um, like that, that excites me. That makes me feel like um, something's going to happen and I'm not going to know what it is. And that's exactly what the future should be shaped like. Cool. And I don't know if you all know that May is Mayor London Breed's Small Business Challenge, where she's asked San Franciscans to only shop at small businesses for a month. So no Amazon, no Safeway, no Walgreens, no Target. Um, I'm participating and it's been easier than I thought it would be. Um, small businesses are so crucial to San Francisco's neighborhoods, um, but the city makes it really hard to run them. So I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to shout out your favorite San Francisco small businesses. Daniel, you want to take this one first? Um, I'm really a big fan of Alembic. Mm -hmm. uh, on Pate Street, they provided us with some delicious uh, libations during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't that know looks why like a prop. Drink during the pandemic. I don't know why <laughs> that would happen, but if you did. And um, of course, they're in a, kind of a partnership with Booksmith on Hate Street, which is a great independent bookstore. Um, I do a little deal with them that you can see online, but also um, it's been really great to see them take Hate Street very seriously as a location that has a lot of trouble and um, that to see that they see their small business as part of a commitment to the neighborhood that they're in and the people who live in that neighborhood. And I think there's so many businesses that um, don't see that as part of their perspective. And I like it, particularly when it's something like a bar or like a bookstore that may seem kind of elitist from the outside to know that um, they've really done a great, great job in um, having hate businesses work together for what's going on in that neighborhood and what's going on in the city. I think that's really great. Mm -hmm. Gary, what are your favorite small businesses? Well, I live in North Beach, so it's a target rich environment for yeah. wonderful small <laughs> businesses. And I just have to give a shout out, not just, of course, to the immortal City Lights Books, one of the great bookstores in the world, but all the independent bookstores in San Francisco, uh, Green Apple Books, The Booksmith, uh, West Portal Books. So the list goes on and on. And, you know, nothing is more important if you love books and writers and reading than to patronize your local bookstores. You know, if you have to do Amazon, you have to do it. But if you don't have to shop local and yeah. the uh, yeah. And uh, and then, yeah, just, the you know, the, all the wonderful cafes, the, you know, the Cafe Trieste, the the great bars of uh, Vesuvio and Specs. And, you know, there's been these tragedies. Uh, I just learned yesterday that one of the weird one of the last remaining downtown, not quite a dive bar, but it's just a deep urban bar. And there's almost none left. This strange place with the strange name of the summer place at the corner of Bush and Mason. Now, which has these really great old sort of B-girl like Korean old ladies that ran it and you could smoke in there. They'd kind of fold up a little coaster. They have a fireplace and a jukebox and just the flotsam and jetsam of urban life would go through there because it's on Bush Street. It's closed forever. I just heard oh. so, and that's because of the pandemic. The, the owner just didn't want to do it anymore. And the covid gave him a chance. So there's just so many great joints like that all over town. I'm a big bar fly. And so in my in all moral earnestness, I ur urge our audience to go out and, and patronize as many of those bars as possible to keep them alive. <laughs> it's your moral responsibility. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Kimberly? Do you have favorite San Francisco small businesses? Yeah, I lived in between both of the Green Apples, and so I love them. Um, I really love my Elder Goths at the Cat Club. Um, I miss that bar. And um, if I'm being honest, I think I missed most about San Francisco, the fish burrito at Pancho Villa. So. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> um, and are you all hopeful that all these vacant storefronts that we had even before the pandemic and are you know, even more now since so many small businesses like the bar you cited, Gary, have left, um, will we see you know, entrepreneurs come in and fill those? Um, or is this sort of a, you know, the end of the bustling neighborhoods with tons of small businesses on all the blocks? Daniel, what's your thought on that? 
I mean, I'm not good at this kind of prediction and I can't pretend to be economically knowledgeable enough to have any solid analysis, but I hope so. Yeah. You know, when I see the, the empty storefronts, I think this is an opportunity, I hope, for um, young and diverse groups of people to figure out something and to try something. And I mm -hmm. just think that that's the city is you always see people trying something and that's always inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I hope, uh, I hope that's, I hope that, uh, the city tries to make more and more incentives for that to happen. Um, because I mean, growing up here when I was a kid, I grew up near West portal. And then when I was in my early twenties, I lived in the mission and, um, uh, near Buena Vista Park and to kind of wander around and just always see like the crazy idea for a little shop. Yeah. Um, when I was in high school, my favorite haunt was a place called the White Room with the Blue Glow, which was a bar that served only water so that we what? <laughs> could buy pretentious mineral water <laughs> and, and feel like super cool, like we were in a bar. And that is crazy. And, you know, that like, sounds like the like, worst bar ever. Yeah. I, I mean, it, uh, but it was like a magical place for me in high school. I played kind of ambient music. It was. Uh, <laughs> I went out of business in the wake of the 89 quake. And, you know, I can't really make a case that I'm surprised that it went out of business. <laughs> I love, like, I like to have something like that, that you can go to in adolescence um, was really powerful. And that's the kind of thing that I think like makes a city so interesting. That makes you not want to live in Denver. Yeah. No offense to Denver personally. <laughs> They don't have any mineral water bars, as far as I know. I know Denver. they don't have a good water bar in Denver, otherwise. They <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Kimberly? Are you hoping that some creative types like the water bar come in? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it sounds pretty terrible. Um, but <laughs> I was 16, okay? <laughs> um, you know, what I can say, what I can see in New York, and my father is a small business owner, um, and I do... Uh, if I were to make a prediction, I'd say that a lot of the old school small businesses are probably going to go to the wayside. It seems like um, the the people who are more tech savvy, you know, um, and who I mean, it took me a, a, so long to just get my dad to like to get him online to sign up mm -hmm. for the government programs and to try to explain how that worked. And so um, it just seems like those who aren't tech fluent are just going to be left behind, um, sadly. And therefore, a city like San Francisco will probably um, fare better than other cities yeah. um, in reopening. Mm -hmm. And Gary, your thoughts on the future of San Francisco small businesses? Well, I'd echo what Daniel said. I'm hopeful, but I'm probably a little more pessimistic. Um, I haven't looked a lot into it. Heather, I'm sure you know, know more, much more about the incentives the city has offered. But I read one or two stories. And the way I read it was if you've got a rapacious a uh, building owner that wants to hold out forever for some huge payoff, which is what's going on with a lot of these empty businesses, these mm -hmm. empty storefronts. They're owned by landlords who wish to like convert into some big score and they don't want to get the two, three, five thousand dollar a month rent they're going to get from whether it's the water bar or whatever it might be, some creative, ordinary small business that isn't going to generate massive revenue there. And they're willing to take the loss. And they probably a lot of them are like really big corporations. They are big, soulless, really messed up corporations that are damaging cities all over the country with their irresponsible behavior in terms of the fabric of urban life. And the city doesn't have the muscle. I don't think financially, it's what I've seen in order to move that needle, you'd have to make the incentives so great um, that I don't see any way they could do it. So, you know, it may be there can be an edge, a shunning and shaming of these big soulless corporations that are like ruining our cities by holding out for maximum profit. But, you know, um, I guess you know, knowing how capitalism works, I'm not super hopeful that that's going to magically happen. Right. I agree. And also another wrinkle is City Hall makes it so hard to even get a permit. If you do find a right. landlord willing to rent to you, you have to pay the rent and then try right. months and months and months of getting permission to open your business. So a lot to improve. So we have some interesting questions coming in from the audience. Um, a spinoff of the small business question. Uh, somebody's asking, what are your favorite restaurants in the city and why? 
Gary, what's your fave? I'm sure you have lots in North Beach. Oh, well, I'm going to go out of North Beach. Just kind of a wild card. This is a kind of a shout out to the Richmond district. But there's a really great pizza restaurant out there with the most hilarious 50s decor. Very thin New York slide style <laughs> uh, pizza. It's called Gaspari's. It used to be called Vince's and it's on Geary out around, I don't know, 23rd or something like that. But it has like the green, you know, Naga hide seats and best of all, the, of course, it has the, tr the the plastic leaves in the ceiling, adding that unique uh, ambiance. But it has the little jukeboxes in each booth, in, which also include a lot of old Italian songs. So it's, it's just a, and it's great pizza. So I, I love I love that place. That place is just rocks. And uh, uh, in North Beach. Uh, Moe's is still one of the best burgers in, in town uh, mm -hmm. on, on Upper Grant um, and uh, the Italian homemade. There are a bunch of young Italians, I think, from Bologna, and they, they make great homemade pasta um, that's in North Beach. So the list goes on and on. Yeah. How about you, Kimberly? Um, I'm going to second Gaspari's. Um, Yay. <laughs> so good. I can't believe um, you know about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. We all got to go. We all gotta <laughs> I know. Go. Let's go now. <laughs> no, it's funny. Um, I was dating another New Yorker, and I remember he was like, okay, <laughs> this is the one pizza I feel solid in saying you're going to like. <laughs> um, and to stay in the Richmond, there's a restaurant called the Richmond um, in the Richmond. And it is, oh my God, it is the best find ever. Um, it's, it was sort of like pre COVID, um, friendly before COVID and that you have your own personal booth in the restaurant. Like you don't see other patrons. It's just like, it's sort of like draped <laughs> off, um, which is my dream. Delayed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was, it's my dream. And it, um, it has like the best, like four, it, it's like a four course menu, but it, becomes a seven course menu because the actual chef comes to talk to you and gives you, I mean, it's just, it's such an experience. And so it was always my secret weapon to bring people there. Cool. How about you, Daniel? Um, yeah, well, I, I don't want to sound like I'm not loyal to Gaspari's. I just want to say that like, <laughs> it's so magical. And because it's, I think one thing that's being hunted to extinction in this town is a salad that has canned beets in it. And that's what you can get at Gaspari. You can't get it very many places. It's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm going to go for the pork store. Um, it's one of the places I miss the most um, during the pandemic because it's one of those things that's like, there are a lot of restaurants, I think, that kind of found their game in terms of takeout or delivery or whatever. But the pork store is a diner. It's, I'm sure that some people will manage to get their food, but it just didn't feel the same. And um, things that I, a, a morning ritual that I missed a lot um, during the pandemic was I'm a bay swimmer. So I would swim at the dolphin club in the morning with a friend of mine or sometimes with my sister. And then the two of us would drive and have a breakfast to warm us up at the pork store. And, um, the dolphin club had to close during the pandemic at the sauna full of mostly old men. So it's like going to be the last thing to open, I think. <laughs> and, um, and uh, I still got to swim there, but I, it was so cold to swim there without a club that I never got to go to the pork store. And the pork store opened for only for breakfast and lunch, which just felt like a novelty too. And um, when you have a big breakfast there, you have that glorious food coma where you don't have to do anything for the rest of the day, but kind of lie around and remember your wonderful breakfast. <laughs> this is making me hungry. Um, this is kind of a dangerous question for me to ask, but it's from the audience, so I will do it. Is there a biggest mistake or misconception made by journalists who write about San Francisco? Daniel. Yeah, I mean, so many myths about San Francisco are reductive. You know, I mean, I think what um, Kimberly covers very well in her essay is, um, you know, this, that there's a, I think there's an opportunity for a city that's leftist to really take stock of itself rather than be kind of righteous about other places. And I think that that's discouraged when people are kind of propping up your mythology all the mm -hmm. time. So I think that's, I mean, that's kind of a vague answer, but, um, you know, I think there's always people who are like, there surely can't be any homophobia in San Francisco. You know, there surely can't be any racism in San Francisco. Like, there surely can't, you know, surely the homeless people are just kind of hippies living their own life, like all the mythology that's so pernicious that helps um, anyone. But I mean, on the other hand, like at any given bar in San Francisco, the assumptions being made about, say, the entire region of the Midwest are probably just as pernicious. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Kimberly, anything come to your mind about a misconception made by journalists who write about San Francisco? Um, yeah, I think, Gar uh, I think Daniel just covered it really well. I, I think it's just that misconception that it's a super left place, you know, and that everybody is just like, um, you know, a hippie, like a dirty hippie at that. <laughs> it's, like, it's so not the case. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty preppy town nowadays, as a matter of fact. So, um, you know, I think that that misconception. Mm -hmm. And Gary, you're a fellow journalist. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's probably mostly just a tendency to just keep rerunning the same old kind of summer of love cliches, you know, mm -hmm. the countercultural mecca. And, you know, then on the other, that's one side that gets kind of reified and pumped up and over mythologized. And then I think actually, to some degree, the, the sort of tech versus the counterculture clash also gets slightly simplified and made too manichaean, too black and white. It's 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 more nuanced than that. I think I've seen just a thousand stories by journalists that parachute in and they they've been clearly told, like, it's the hippies against the techies. And it's just it's a little it's a little too crude. Uh, there's truth in it. You know, there's usually a grain of truth in all of these. You know, when some editor comes up with some big theme and he sends a reporter out to cover it, it's not like he's just making it up. But often it you know, they don't get that. They don't get that deep into the nuances of it. So I think it's some of that. Mm -hmm. They are also always obligated to point out how much a burrito costs. I've noticed oh, right, right. a fifteen dollar burrito. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is another audience question that's kind of interesting. How would you define what it means to be a San Franciscan? Gary, do you have an idea? Um, I think it's almost insulting to tell somebody, you know, how they have to be. I mean, one of the things that's great about cities and make cities so vibrant and so strange and, and you know, these unique conglomerations of different atoms is that they're they're filled with individuals who bring their own thing to the party. And San Francisco's always been that. So it's a, sort of a paradox. Obviously, the cliched answer to be a San Franciscan, you're supposed to be utterly crazy, individualistic, anarchistic, hedonistic, you know, <laughs> having sex with 70 people and doing 70 kinds of drugs and making up 70 new kinds of avant-garde songs and breaking 19 paradigms. And, you know, of course, <laughs> you love it if, you know, when people do that. But you can't, you know, to say, oh, if you don't do that, if you're just like a working schmo, you're not a San Franciscan. Uh, that's insulting. And it, it, it reduces the whole history of the city. So I think what to be, I guess it's has to be a paradoxical answer. Be true to yourself. Um, do try to learn about this town, you know, learn about its rich legacy and all the great things about it and the bad things about it and choose your own course. And if you choose your own course, um, it's like Daniel was saying earlier about young people bringing life. You know, it's like what Duke Ellington said, you know, I, I stay young by playing with young cats and, and light, new life's always coming in. And God forbid that we older San Franciscans should like prescribe how the young people are supposed to behave. So I think, you know, be respectful, do your homework, learn where you live and do your own thing. Mm -hmm. Very well said. How do you follow that, Kimberly? You want to try? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, um, I so I tried very lightly here as a New Yorker, um, especially as a second generation New Yorker, because I have a chip on my shoulder about people who come to my city, you know, straight out of Duluth, you know, to tell me that the Bronx is ghetto or Queens isn't cool. Like, really? Uh, you just got here. Um, and so I try to be really respectful and not do that to other cities and to sort of point out, you know, like, I'm not a native San Franciscan, you know, like I moved here um, and I don't have the holistic perspective that someone, you know, who was born here um, has. And I see a huge difference too. in like the way that native San Franciscans think of their city, as opposed to the people who, you know, just are fly-ins. Um, and so the whole notion of like, do I even consider myself a San Franciscan? I mean, yes, <laughs> but at the same time, um, you know, there's this thing like people are always like, well, how long do I have to live in New York before I become a New Yorker? And I'm always like, never. 
<laughs> like, you just <laughs> you weren't born here. So, um, you know, it's a tricky thing. I think I, we all get territorial about our cities, um, but I try to be super respectful and always defer to native San Franciscans, um, you know, about their city. Mm -hmm. And Daniel? Uh, I think you have to live in Dublin and get a full brain. <laughs> so, uh, um, I think, I guess I just, I mean, this will sound cheap maybe, but I just think that being a real San Franciscan means actually maybe not participating in the conversation about being a real San Franciscan. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, because one of the things that I love about this city and because of the, if it's relatively small area is that you just walk a little way and then there's something else happening and there's something else uh there's another family with a whole different set of assumptions and a whole different set of significances and i think that's really beautiful you know and that um yeah and uh you know new york has its fun kind of being new york and i think because there's so many people that maybe they want to come up with a list of things but i just feel like um you know, if you speak uh, in a, if you speak no English and you are immersed in your own original culture, you are still a San Franciscan in San Francisco, as much as like you know, two people the Tadish Grill being like, and I remember the day when this happened. And so, I just think that San Francisco has had a history of um, so many people coming here for sanctuary, like not always welcomed, and it hasn't always been smooth, but like that has been, that's been the goal of the people arriving. I always think that's, and maybe, and this is maybe one of the biggest misunderstandings about San Francisco is that it's talked about as a sanctuary city, as if the city is welcoming people. But I think it's more that this is made of a city of people who have welcomed themselves, who have come in said like, you know what, I'm going to do it this way. And, um, and that to me feels San Francisco. And so when anyone starts messing with like, that's not really San Francisco, if you do this, it's like, that's, I don't know. That's, I feel like that is always someone who turns out grew up in Atherton. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are, someone else is asking, what are the actual politics of the residents of San Francisco? Are there a lot of conservatives who just don't shout it out loudly? Gary, do you have any ideas on that? Well, you, Heather, the person best able to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> I've been writing a lot about this. Yes. I mean, we know that uh, you know, we know what percentage of people in this city voted for Donald Trump. It was about 10%. 10%. Yeah. And um, so it, you know, certainly by the most you know, obvious standards, this is not a very conservative city. It's, you know, when you have 90% in the hate, I think in the hate, there was something like, you know, a handful of people in all of those precincts voted for Donald Trump. It was like 10,000 to 10 or something. So this is a. Uh, but know, who are those 10 people who live I in know. the hate and voted for they're, Donald they're, Trump? They're hunkered. I don't want them. I don't want them. <laughs> And very few of them are putting bumper stickers on their cars because, no. you know, they're going to get keyed or whatever. But, you know, I mean, as Kimberly said, obviously there is appearance and reality and there's, you know, there are people that don't always behave the way that their ideology says that they they are going to behave. So, you know, there's there's complications. But I think in general, this is a this is actually a pretty liberal city um, by, you know, and it's very I'm very disappointed to hear about Kimberly's experiences. It's really sad. Um, but I'd like to think that most people here are reasonably tolerant and, you know, b believe in actually uh, sort of, uh, you know, big D Democratic Party uh, values of the working for the for the good of, of the of the less fortunate, of being willing to be taxed, of being willing to make sacrifices sacrifices and uh, and being, you know, fairly, fairly racially enlightened. Um, I think that, you know, it's been a long struggle and we're not there yet. But I think in general, the city is 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 pretty liberal. And, uh, you know, the conservative conservatives are, you know, are pretty they're rather hunkered down. I think, you know, I think they're they know that it's not um, you know, it's not particularly easy for them to come out and say stuff. But, you know, they're there. My downstairs neighbor is a Trump supporter. You know, so there's like, you know, there there, there are people around who don't fit the stereotype. But I think the city is this is a very left wing city. What did your neighbor tell you about why he or she is a Trump supporter? Oh, you know, it's kind of I think a lot of it is that sort of the liber the sort of right libertarian ethos. 
not so much like coming out of a really uh, coherent political worldview, but it's it's kind of uh, being a self-employed, right-leaning libertarian who then listens to a lot of uh, right-wing talk radio. Um, and, you know, that's a very potent uh, <laughs> drug, if you will. Uh, it's a very, very potent, uh, has incredibly powerful effects on people. And it's a whole it's almost like a whole way of life in a way. And, and it works on you know, there's some there's like grains of 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 legitimate issues that get blown up into these enormous resentments that just become like you know, these massive resent resentment figures. And so, you know, I, I don't really, I don't, you know, I don't can't say absolutely, but I think it's, it's things like that that are, that are driving his, his, his feelings that way. Mm -hmm. And Kimberly, what are your thoughts on the actual politics of the residents of San Francisco? Um, I think it's more nuanced than who you pull the lever for um, when you're voting. Um, I don't think not voting for Trump makes you immune um, to conservatism or would it, what that even means. I mean, to me, the Democratic Party is pretty conservative at this point. Um, you know, download the next door app, <laughs> see the conversation no that kidding. people have. No. Um, and then we'll talk about how, you know, conservative or tolerant San Francisco is. Mm -hmm. I purposefully have never joined next door because it's horrifying. <laughs> yeah. It is horrifying. <laughs> there are plenty of good BDSM bars that you can just go to without joining that. Without <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I think it's as Kimberly said that it's that, you know, the temptation in a two party political system is to be like, well, you, then you must be over here or you must be over here. And to kind of um, try to draw statistics from that seems to me misleading. I mean, I was really um, struck by how many people were shocked at um, allegations and investigations into the San Francisco uh, police department. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there was this like, oh, that stuff that we're reading about that we're all on the streets about is something that's happening elsewhere. And that, um, you know, that would be an example of something that I would call right wing ideology, even if plenty of them were not necessarily voting for whoever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think and I know that um, as a graduate of Lowell High School, which has been a huge controversy forever, but but certainly this year. And I know that Heather's covered it very well. You also saw the way in which um, kind of leftist good thought and conservative ideology can even really be intertwined. That the ways that the people's own kind of fascist instincts and, um, and violent intolerance can be hand in hand with kind of what we think of as um, leftist values or leftist conclusions. So I do, I would agree that it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. And um, and San Francisco is, you know, uh, oddly segregated in a way, you know, just what I just said about like, if you walk two blocks, something else is happening. Like that's, that's the nicer way of saying, and there's also all these little bubbles that people are in. And if you're feeling parochial and you feel like your values are being threatened, then you're going to react in a way that's going to seem like conservatism, even if you, you know, recycle and listen to the Grateful Dead or something. <laughs> What did you think about the change to Lowell? So for those listening who aren't aware, the school board changed it this year from being merit based where you have to take a test to get into being a lottery. Um, I think it's really complicated. I'm grateful that I, it wasn't my job to figure it out, frankly. Um, I, I attended Lowell and when I attended Lowell, um, because of, because affirmative action was legal then, there were very specific quotas and numbers that different people had to hit. And, um, I saw how that often played, played out to be a kind of peg to hang racism on between students and, um, different students experiences of Lowell are really different. Um, so I don't know, you know, I mean, the real solution is to have really bona fide, wonderful public education from coast to coast in this, in this country. You know, that's the thing I think is to not have this such a tiny number of schools that so many people want to get in that they feel are so tied to success. And mm -hmm. that's, um, you know, if that's as many of these problems we're talking about, that's not an easy fix, or it might be a simple fix, but it ain't easy. It's not happening anytime soon. And so, you know, it, it would, I think it would be nice to begin to acknowledge when we talk about something like whole high schools that like the reason why all, you know, so many eyes in the nation are on how the admissions process is going to work for a one high school in San Francisco is because it is such a rarity. 
Mm-hmm. And I mean, it was a real blessing for me. It was a real um, a chamber of horrors for many other people I knew and went to school with. And um, it's just tough. I'm, um, I'm grateful I have another job instead. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody from the audience is um, tagging onto that question by asking what you all think of the school board wanting to change the names of so many schools. I, Gary, you wrote an impassioned essay about that. You want to <laughs> so also, again, if you're not aware, um, the school board was about to change the names of 44 schools named after people they found controversial, including Abraham Lincoln, um, Diane Feinstein, um, and then got well, sued over also, it. So, I, I would have to say, including Francis Scott Key, including... Some, right. Yeah. Yes, of course. There were, there were. <laughs> yes, it was a mixed bag. Um, it's on pause now because they got sued. But Gary, what do you think of all that? I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. Um, it was just a, a complete waste of time. Uh, empty virtue signaling does not improve the actual lot of black people, of people of color, of disadvantaged students in any way. Um, it was uh, half of the decisions they made were just wrong on the face of embarrassingly factually wrong. But beyond that, just this notion that you're going to go out and take these names so seriously and that you and you pretend that if you change these names, you're going to be affecting making real social change when the real social change that we need to happen in our educational system is so profound, so deep and so intractable so difficult. So to me, a lot of this is like this is an easy way of signaling your virtue and you're not actually taking on these really hard things that are going to take a lot of money, a lot of commitment and a lot of work across all levels of society to make these changes. Instead, we go, oh, we're going to Abraham Lincoln had a bad policy towards native native peoples. This is absurd. I mean, every historical figure has feet of clay and you can find them on every one. So I just thought it was looking like a national embarrassment, frankly. Yeah. Kimberly, I don't know if you've had the misfortune of following the San Francisco school board in much detail, but do you want to weigh in at all? Yeah. um, I, so I actually had no idea that Lowell had switched to that system. Um, I went to Bronx science in New York, um, which is uh, pretty much the Lowell of the East coast. Um, And I've written at length. I mean, like my, one of my theses was on affirmative action and, um, you know, the selective schools in New York city and a lottery just, a it seems like a mockery. I had no idea that that's what it turned into, but, um, I do very much want to do away with the standardized, te- standardized tests to get into these, um, institutions. I think a more holistic application, like a college application would make more sense, um, in these circumstances. Like I know that Cal just did away with the SATs. Um, and so things like that I see as like positive movement in the right direction. Um, but yeah, a lottery like that just seems that just seems like a, such a cheap throwaway answer to a really, really complicated problem that is, I mean, you need top to bottom reform entirely in the education system to get it right. Mm-hmm. And Daniel, did you have any thoughts on the name changes as a father of public school kids and a public school grad yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes more actually from some of the political organizing and um, I mean, I don't like to think of myself as an activist, but the ways that I've been involved in politics here and there in San Francisco and that when the best changes happen and when the most inspiring actions are happen, there's real community and solidarity and solidarity is tough, right? Because it, it, there's always three people who agree with each other saying like, we want solidarity and like stay out of here until we get it. And you have to welcome people in. And it just seems to me that changing the name of a school is like a perfect opportunity to bring school communities together. And so rather than having an argument about various historical figures, including the inaccuracies that definitely the school board was using to do this, um, that, you know, there are many people who's, who, have their names on schools and they're not resonating with the community that they're serving. So rather than just figuring out whether they're bad or not, you can have this conversation about like, Hey, we're going to start renaming. I mean, I would love to see the schools are renamed every eight years or something. And so the school community gets together. Students could present choices that they make. People could make a decision about it. And it would be kind of a joyous time to think, and you don't have to entrench names of schools. 
you know? And so rather than saying like, here's something I think about Abraham Lincoln, here's something I think about Abraham Lincoln. It's like, okay, Abraham Lincoln, there's a million biographies of Abraham Lincoln. His legacy will continue to be debated to this day. And then there's more, there are more, in my opinion, clean cut cases of, okay, this is a famous guy we've heard of, but like their views for the most part were monstrous. Mm -hmm. And but even rather than trying to figure out whether their views are monstrous, just say like, okay, who, who would be good to name a school after? Yeah. You know, what would be a good, or, or if not a person, you know, what's a, what's a plant here that means something to the community or what, you know, and there's, and there's so many opportunities to do that. And I think particularly when schools were closed, that just really seemed like an insult to say, mm -hmm. Don't worry, the name above the door that you are not going into <laughs> change. Just real I can't, it's hard, I'm hard pressed to think of that as a step forward. But to say, you know what, that we're all trying to think about history and race and culture and divisiveness in new ways. Like let's rename these schools when we're all here and we can all have a meeting about it. That's great. But for some people to like lock away and unilaterally start changing these things, that's how we got those names is that other people weren't welcome into that conversation. And so welcome a bunch of people into the conversation and out of all conversations to have, like a conversation about a name seems just, just like a great opportunity for me. The idea that there weren't a bunch of seventh graders who were all had different people involved and all had a project that they were doing and all presenting it is such a wasted opportunity. Yeah, yeah completely agree. Should be way more of a community discussion about all of these things, including the removal of all these statues. You know, yeah. when Christopher and then Columbus, we'd, have, we'd have Duke Ellington Middle yeah. School, which has been Gary's yeah. dream his whole life. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. No, there. Ornette Coleman. But <laughs> I think San Francisco needs to name a public school after a, a drag queen. So I've been advocating for that. There you go. I mean, why not? Well, I think that we have talked longer than we were even supposed to, but it was really fun to chat with you all. And I think we should all go to Gaspari's Pizza together sometime soon. Yay. <laughs> Let's do it. After flight, here we gotta... <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much to journalist and historian Gary Camilla, poet, essayist, and cultural critic Kimberly Reyes, and writer and musician Daniel Handler, also well known as Lemony Snicket. All are contributors to the new book, The End of the Golden Gate, which is available at your local bookstore and online. We also want to remind everyone that a percentage of the proceeds from The End of the Golden Gate will be given to Hamilton families to help those in the Bay Area experiencing homelessness. Thank you to all of our viewers. I'm Heather Knight, and now this program of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned.